Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the man, the myth, the legend, Arnold Schwarzenegger. His own, he gets his own microphone at his own. Arnold, everybody, everybody, Arnold. Lucky me, look at that. That's a, that's a, uh. Arnold, congratulations once again. Uh, your team did an outstanding job. What a great weekend. You saw a return past the COVID years last year, but this year it looks like we're back to business as usual. Expo jam-packed with people from all over the world, and the show fantastic. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much, and I just want to say that, that it feels so good to sit up here on the stage in front of all of you with such great champions. These are the people that uh, have all contributed so much in building the sport of bodybuilding and making the millions of people out there getting kind of turned on to bodybuilding and going to the gym. Everyone always needs inspiration. And I think the ones that you see here on the stage have given so much inspiration to so many millions of people. So. I really appreciate that, the great work that you've done. And so we're also very happy that we were able to give Che uh, the Lifetime Achievement Award. And uh, because, you know, it's one thing to become a champion, and not only a champion, but a great, great champion. But then there's another thing to really go all out in promoting the sport. And I think that's what Che has done for you know, his whole life. And so it's really great. He's very articulate the way he speaks and everything like that. And so is everyone else here on this stage. So it's really great, you know, to be with, with a team like that. For me, it's all about what can we do to promote the sport of bodybuilding. And so this is why we work throughout the entire year trying to figure out always how do we get more people to come and be interested in this? How do we live stream it to make it accessible? How do we make sure that the bodybuilders are getting better all the time and their performance is getting better? How do we get more sponsors involved? How much do we pack more people in there? And so it's really, a, that, that's what it's all about. And so it has, this weekend was the most successful Arnold Classic weekend ever. We have had the most crowd. We had the best bodybuilding lineups and then the whole thing. I mean, the most sponsorship money. And this is why, when I saw the success, I said to myself, that's why I said yesterday, we're going to up the cash price because we can afford it now, even though we still have to make millions of dollars back that we lost during the COVID. But still, we can see the direction that we are going now and that we can up the cash prices because the whole idea is, is to share this money. And uh, so we're going to go and move it up to $500,000, the, the cash price for the winner. And then, of course, all the other cash prices are going to go up right behind that. And, uh, you know, because for years we kept the money below because that's what I promised Joe and Ben Weider that I would not compete with the Olympia. But, uh, you know, now they have passed on and I know that Joe is, uh, and Ben is smiling down from heaven to see how successful we are. And they would want me to go and put a, bit, a little bit of pressure on the Olympia and say, okay, we're gonna give 500, so maybe you now go to 600. You know, so this is the idea is to create competition, not for us to be number one, but just to move on and to, to really pressure the Olympia also to go up with the cash prices. And so hopefully they listen to that and uh, they will do that. And uh, so for us, it's all about producing the best show and to make it really entertaining for everyone to watch. Arnold's still the competitor after all these years, right? And so it never leaves you. You got the competitive spirit. Speaking of competitions, so I'm watching the Super Bowl, and I'm generally thinking to myself, these commercials suck. Like, these are terrible. Like, they're probably the worst commercial. And then Agent State Farm comes on. 
and you just blew it away. I mean, this was vote. You could see. I mean, right throughout the whole rest of the night, the people are voting out there. Best commercial ever. This was great. Whose idea? That I, I mean, obviously, I don't know who put it together, but I, I get the strange feeling that might have been your idea to put that the concept together. It was fantastic. Oh, I wish I could take credit for this kind of brilliant writing, but I can't because they came to me with this idea and uh, they said, you know, we're going to go and do exactly the opposite of what happened to you in the 70s. Because in the 70s, everyone said you will never be a leading man in the movies because you have an accent. And now, you know, 50 years later, they're doing now a TV commercial playing on that accent. And, uh, you know, and so I, I read the commercial and said, this is really funny. Uh, you know, we have a good neighbor. He says, no, 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 we'll hold it. Wait a minute. <laughs> you know, Arnold, I'm, I'm hearing neighbor. Uh, it's neighbor. And uh, I said, hey, that's what I said, neighbor. And I uh, said, no, 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 no. I said, look, this, this woman is in labor. I said, no, it's not labor, it's labor. I said, hey, get to the chopper. No, it's not chopper, it's chopper. And so, you know, so this is how it goes. So, so they, they, it was really, I, I think that people loved it because it was real, you know, I have an accent, my movie lines became famous because of the accent, you know, but it was, I mean, if you think about it, why would someone repeat the line like it's not a tumor? <laughs> like in Kindergarten Cops. It's, it's too much. But it's, 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 you know, but it's, it's, it's kind of like, also I said it with a D rather than with a T, right? So it's not a tumor. So the tumor, so the kids were all laughing. I said, this guy's an idiot. He, did, he cannot even pronounce tumor the right way. But so when they were laughing, then the director said, oh, we got to keep that. Let's keep the take. That's really funny. So it's, it's all about, you know, like get to the chopper or, you know, stick around. It's just the way I say things. So I'll be back in all those lines. So this is what the State Farm commercial played on. And uh, then, of course, bringing Danny DeVito in and, and, and to save the day, you know, where he says, you know, State Farm is a good neighbor. And then I say to him later on at the thing, I say, you're backstabber. And he says, it's not backstabber, it's backstabber. You know, so, so this is, I, I, you know, it, it, it's, it's just a fun thing. And we were very, I was very happy because you're right, I'm competitive. So, you know, when I found out the next day that we were the number one commercial and that I didn't even know that USA Today has this kind of like thing where they, they test it and they, uh, they have a survey and then and, and so the majority of people liked our commercial. So this was really great because, you know, then they come back again the next year. So this was kind of my third Super Bowl commercial. And uh, so hopefully we do another one next year. I can absolutely yeah. see that uh, coming because, but absolutely fantastic. Um, fantastic writing. Again, congratulations on that. But Thank you. Arnold, as, as I've made my way throughout the weekend here, um, I've got various duties that I have to do, and I've, I've found myself in the position of having to be useful. And uh, you have been busier than ever. A brand new book, Be Useful. Um, why the title? Well, it's, it's just my, my father always said, be useful. You know, the, the, that was the most common thing he always said. You know, go out and work and uh, help people. And so I always remember that. And so when I sleep past 5.30 or so in the morning, I hear this voice, you know, be useful. Don't lie in bed. It's kind of like my father always said, he says, you know, this country was not built by people sleeping in. And then when I came to America, I realized the same thing is in America. America was not built by people sleeping in. You know, this was built by people that got up at five in the morning, or worked all night, and slaved away, and all this. And so, so I think there's something to be really, uh, you know, kind of learned from. And so I always took this kind of seriously. So when I wrote the seven rules of the seven kind of like, uh, you know, um, yeah, rules that to uh, be successful, I said myself, I should call it that. I should call it, you know, be useful. Another fantastic part. You have been busier than ever this year. You haven't slowed down at all. Did anybody see the Netflix special that Arnold put out? What a great insight into your life. Uh, and you were very candid. I mean, uh, you've talked about things I don't think people would, would think that you would talk about. Um, you literally just laid it all out there. But um, 
how was it? Uh, talk to us about how that was uh, creating that, that special. And, and I like how they split it up into parts uh, because you didn't have to shortchange anything. You were able to expand on everything you wanted to. Well, first of all, I made it very clear to them that I'm uh, not the kind of person that just likes to brag about my victories. Because in the end, we learn from our mistakes as well as from our victories. And so this is why I think that one has to be honest. I mean, I'm a public person, and you have to be honest and just say to people, look, I'm great, but I also screw up. And I'm not perfect. No one is really perfect, right? So we all make our mistakes. And I made plenty of mistakes, and I had plenty of failures, if it is in bodybuilding, if it is in show business, or if it is personal. I had my failures, and I learned from those failures. And I regret those failures. And uh, so I think that it is very important that we talk openly about it, because I think that people can learn from that. You know, that for me to talk about is, what did I learn from my failures? And, um, and so this is why I think Netflix was very pleased about that, that I was willing to talk about those issues um, and, uh, you know, get into it. And uh, I think that's made the, the documentary also more human and uh, more accessible and, and uh, very successful, as a matter of fact. Not only in America, but internationally, it was the number one, you know, series, uh, uh, you know, documentary series uh, out there for, for, for months. And the same was also the case with the TV series FUBAR, you know, so that was number one for months. And so we were very happy. Then, then after that, the book came out, uh, you know, to be useful, and that was number one for months. So it was very, very and then the, the, the commercial came out, that was number one. So there was a lot of number ones, and it's always good to be number one, you know. It's a, but of course, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's not kind of the only thing, but I mean, it's like, because, like I said, there could be things that I'm doing in the future that are not number one. So that's okay, but in the meantime, I take it. Well, you're I undefeated this year, yeah, so, exactly. so, so far, so good. That's it, yes. Um, so now we have the number one bodybuilding show, so that's to me the most important thing. And um, I, just, I just wanted to tell you that an observation, and I don't know if, if everyone else agrees with me on that or not, but I mean, when I saw the guys posing the last two days, you know, Friday and Saturday. I thought that their stamina, their energy, when they had their pose-offs, was absolutely extraordinary. Absolutely amazing. Because, and the reason why I'm saying this is because I'm, a, I, I, I'm the first one to criticize bodybuilding. And 10 years ago, I remember, 15 years ago, I criticized bodybuilding. I said, I said, what's going on here? This is the top guys in the world. And after a few poses, they were huffing and puffing, and, they, they, and, and their stomach was hanging out. They couldn't you know, keep the vacuum, and they couldn't keep their stomach in, and they couldn't keep themselves in the, under control. They were posing, and then uh, you know, they were shaking up there when they held the pose for a longer period of time. And I said, what is this? This is like a bunch of you know, cripples. <laughs> so I was criticizing them. I said, none of them could do a vacuum anymore. They're shaking, they're sweating, they're, you know, they're out of control. They're not really in shape that like a world champion should be. Because there's all world champions up there on, the, on this stage. And so this, I think, this criticism maybe they've taken seriously. And the Federation also has taken seriously this whole thing and have put much more emphasis on, on posing. Because posing is really the only way where you can display your body. And so when I saw this last two days, the guys posing up there and being called out by the judges, do the double bicep back, do the double bicep front, do the lat spread, do the side chest, do the abs, do the, the vacuum, do this, do that. And they kept going on and on and on and there was no one huffing and puffing up there on the stage. They just stepped forward, they did their poses, and it was like totally casual. And I said to myself, this is fantastic. I got inspired by that when I saw, 
I mean, Hadi, I mean, was like there posing and smiling and doing his vacuum like it was nothing. It was just very fantastic to see that. And so uh, I just want to say congratulations to these bodybuilders for having improved their condition. And that I could tell that they have been posing for hours and hours and hours every day in order to get into that kind of a shape. So congratulations to all of them. You know, Arnold, I think some of that can be attributed to by the addition of our classic physique division. It seems since we brought that in and the popularity has gone through the roof, that a lot of the bodybuilders, not just in classic, but in open, um, have taken note of that. And the posing has improved, and the stomach control, and the vacuums have come out. And of course, your three-quarter, the iconic three-quarter back pose has got to be in anybody's routine now. But um, you know, we saw some of that great with, with Wesley Vissers, your 2024 champion, uh, posing absolutely extraordinary. Uh, and a pure throwback, I think Wesley um, epitomizes the look of classic physique. So I think that has really helped uh, to do everything that you're saying. Absolutely. And I have to say, your posing and uh, your physique was extraordinary. I mean, you were the true winner of that uh, uh, category. And uh, I think you were fantastic. And I think that people will be looking up to him for a long time to this kind of a physique. So. Thank you very much for the great job that you have done. Thank you for the incredible compliments, Arnold. You're my idol in posing. I've been watching you for literally 50 years, your old posing routines, slowing them down on YouTube, seeing exactly how, to, how the transitions are that you do. And I've been learning and uh, by your teachings on YouTube and trying to mimic that every single day. And I'm glad that uh, I was able to show up at the Arnold Classic stage, so thank you. Arnold, two of the most prestigious awards we have, uh, which we continue to this day, is the Ed Corney Best Poser Award. And we saw that with Samson Dauda um, last night. Fantastic physique. Uh, what a great competition with him and Hadi Chupan. And, of course, I know this is near and dear to your heart, but the Franco Colombo Most Muscular Man Award, uh, which, of course, went to our winner, Hadi Chupan. Well, I mean, it's, uh, look, Franco Colombo was so muscular. He had such thick muscles. I mean, we are, we are talking here about like, you know, 50 years ago. So the standards were different then. But I mean, it was just extraordinary to see someone that is, weighs 185 pounds and to have this much thickness and to be so dangerous for the big guys. I mean, Franco would, you know, kind of like beat big guys left and right. And not only on a stage with the posing, but also with power. I mean, he would just go to the gym and he would do press behind the neck with 315. With 350, I mean, three big Olympic plates on each side of the Olympic bar. And he would be doing press behind the neck for that. I mean, you, you don't see anyone with 185 to do this, and not even the big guys do this kind of well, a weight. Arnold, the fact that he was able to compete in the world's strongest man. Now, you're talking again, Arnold. Uh, um, Arnold. Franco was, what, 5'4"? Yeah. On a good day, right? Well, that, that's a really good day. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's with high heels. <laughs> <laughs> Five, whatever, with, at, at 185 pounds, he beat people in the world's strongest man. That just shows a tremendous strength. But the fact that you continue to honor him to this day, and I know you guys were as, as close as brothers. I, I miss him because he used to join us here uh, on Sunday, which was always great because the stories that you guys would share of the old days of coming to America, Joe Weider, all that was absolutely phenomenal. But it's great to see that his memory is still alive here at the Arnold. Well, you know, we want to keep it alive. And I think it's always great when each one of the bodybuilding champions, you know, kind of like is being remembered for decades to come or for centuries to come. And this is to me the important thing. That's why we, I, when we ran the first Mr. Olympia competition, I came up with the idea to hand out a trophy that is a statue of Eugene Sandow. Because I wanted to make sure that everyone in the world would never forget Eugene Sandow because that's where bodybuilding came from. And Joe Weider always was kind of a huge fan and Ben Weider was always a huge fan of Eugene Sandow, did statues of Eugene Sandow in the offices and stuff like that. So I said to myself, we got to continue on this tradition and write about Eugene Sander 
hand out the trophy. And the same is with Franco. That's why I want to hand out the most muscular trophy with Franco's sculpture, with Franco's most muscular, with Franco's, uh, you know, bicep pose. And just, you know, just that uh, Franco's name will be remembered forever. And that's, that, that trophy will be handed out forever. Oh, it's yeah. very coveted. Yeah. You got to, Lee Haney's got to catch a flight, Governor. Lee Haney, you're the champion. I was there in the 80s when you won the Mr. Universe contest. Remember that? In, I think it was Belgium, right? Yep. Yes. And I was the color commentator for, for I think it was ABC Wide World of Sports. Right. And um, so I saw you appearing for the first time on that big stage. So it's so great to see you today and uh, to keep training people all the time. And you're just a, such a wonderful citizen and such a wonderful friend. So thank you very much. Let's give a big hand to Lee Haney. So Arnold, let's. What a great champion, Lee Haney. Just, just simply one of the best. Uh, last night, you decided to honor the great Jay Cutler with a Lifetime Achievement Award. Certainly deserving. Uh, what a great career Jay has had. Um, Jay, in his speech, credited a lot of it of his success to Ronnie Coleman and their rivalry. Um, who do you credit for that same rivalry? You had a kind of a different array of people. Um, certainly Sergio would come to mind, Blue Ferrigno a little bit later, but um, is there anybody that, that you uh, decided, like, okay, I need this guy to kind of be my, you know, I'll lead a Frazier? Well, first of all, I always will give credit to Reg Park, who was Hercules on a big screen when I was 15 years old. And so we used to go to the, to the movies and watch Hercules. And so he was my inspiration. Then eventually I saw a magazine and I started reading about his training and all that. That's what inspired me originally. But then later on, when um, I started winning Mr. Universe, at that very same time, Sergio Liver started winning Mr. Olympia. And so then the following year won Mr. Universe again and Sergio Liver won another Mr. Olympia. And then eventually I knew I'm going to go and run together with this guy, with this monster. I mean, he was extraordinary. What a physique. And just sure enough, in 1969, I won the Mr. Universe contest now for the fourth time uh, in New York. And therefore, I was automatically moved into the Olympia competition. And there I was com competing with Sergio Liver. And I lost which was fair and square. I mean, he was without any doubt better than me, but it gave me tremendous inspiration. You know, as a matter of fact, the right after that, with half a year later, I went to Chicago and I trained with Sergio. And uh, he was really, really friendly. He invited me over to his house to have dinner and he would train with me at the Duncan YMCA in Chicago. And, uh, you know, it was like really a great, great camaraderie there. But of course, my one thought was every time I did a set and every time I watched him do the set or we were posing together in front of the mirror, I said, this is the guy I have to beat this coming year. And so there was this friendship well, he joked about it, and he says, hey, baby, I'm going to beat you again, baby. And he would be having his baby talk. And, uh, and uh, you know, he was very funny, Sergio. And I would say, he says, yeah, you're, you're probably right. You know, I didn't say anything. And, uh, of course, I was going home after these training sessions, and I was using some of his methods. You know, the way he was doing bench press, to do it sometimes half reps, you know, to just shock the muscle and not to give the muscle the same exercise, always full reps, so sometimes it was half reps. Same is with chin-ups and stuff like that. So I copied some of the stuff that he taught me and also his posing and all this, and his leg workout. And he just had the, the work ethic, it was just staggering because he would just start out 
every day with five sets of chin-ups and five sets of bench press and five sets of rowing. He would be doing three sets in a row like that. But this was just warm up, he didn't count that. And then when we did five sets of those three exercises, that's when we started training. By that time I was already exhausted. <laughs> and he said, come on baby, let's do it, you know. And we will just now start training shoulders and arms. And so the next day it was again the same thing, so, you know, chest and back. I mean, it was, it was really insane training and uh, the way he trained his waist and everything like that. So, but they, so it was a good inspiration and a good learning experience working with him. And then of course, that following year, right here in Columbus, Ohio, was the Mr. World competition that Jim Lorimer was the organizer and the promoter of. So they, they organized the world championships in weightlifting. And then after the world championships in weightlifting, they organized the Mr. World competition. And I just came over from London. I just won my fifth Mr. Olymp Mr. Universe contest in London and flew over here to Columbus to win, to compete. And there was Sergio. I thought I'm gonna meet him in New York at the Olympia two weeks later, but there was Sergio on the Mr. World competition. He was right on the stage at the Veterans Memorial Auditorium. And I said to myself, oh my God, luckily I'm just coming for, come from a competition where I post for the whole weekend, so I was cut. I lost some extra body fluid, and uh, I came in cut enough, and I won the competition. So it was not even a Mr. Olympia, it was the Mr. World competition where I won first against Sergio. And then he came to me afterwards, and he said to me, he says, I cannot, I, mean, I don't understand, but what I should do. He says, I'm really screwed. He says, I mean, how could I lose? And I said, I think that for the Olympia, you got to go and gain some weight. <laughs> and he says, you think so? I said, absolutely. So he came to the Olympia, I think five or 10 pounds heavier than he was here in Columbus. And that totally screwed him up because now, <laughs> now he lost the definition and <laughs> You know, so he lost the definition, and so, he, so the judges all went to him afterwards and said, you know, you were not as cut as last year. If you would have been as cut as last year, you could have won again. And then he used to, came to me and said, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyways, this is, but this is the kind of competitions we had. But so with Sergio Liber was my inspiration. And so for, for, to me, that was the standard that to kind of get up to because he was just so enormous. He had such enormous arms and thighs and small waist and huge lats. And, and he had the personality. I loved his personality. And you know, his whole Cuban kind of a thing, a Latino thing, the, the combination. And they kind of like really full of energy and all that stuff. You gave so, him the wrong advices. Exactly, I gave him the wrong advices, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's the same also was the case, you know, with the, with the movie business. I, um, I admired Stallone, but he, it became a competition. It was like literally like the Mr. Olympia competition. It was like who is going to be number one on the end at the box office? Who is going to be number one and kills the most people on the screen? <laughs> who is going to use the biggest knives? Who is going to use the biggest guns? So, you know, he started using a gun that was a really massive machine gun in Rambo. And then I said to myself, screw that. We're going to go and use a gun that is usually mounted on a helicopter. <laughs> and we took that gun and I held it kind of like, sure. there was like my gun. So it was just to outdo Sly with his guns, you know. So there was, it was total madness. Who had less body fat? Who had the better body? Who is more box of his success and this is how, how it went on and on so it was always kind of like someone that you admire but someone that you use as a means of a competition to get you motivated to outperform him and therefore to create more competition and, 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 and more performance. Speaking of which I have to ask this so I heard a story and this is perfect opportunity to confirm it while on the set of Predator you had Jesse Ventura on there and I heard a little story that 
Uh, there was a little friendly competition there about who had the biggest arms. How did that play out? Well, first of all, it doesn't matter what Jesse says. <laughs> the fact is that by far I had the best arms and the biggest arms on that set. That's a given. Okay, yeah. so that's a given. <laughs> but, but I mean, uh, Jesse, Jesse Ventura had a terrific physique and he had a really, really great acting ability. You know, coming from professional wrestling, he had this kind of wonderful speech always, this deep voice and a great rhythm in his, in his uh, kind of dialogue. So he was really, really good in Predator. Did you set him up for the fall, though? Because I, what I heard was is that you got to whoever had a tape measure, and you told them, tell them that you measured my arms, and they were, whatever, 20 inches, and uh, to make him feel as though he, uh, his arms were bigger. But that wasn't the case. Well, I don't remember the, the measurement thing. I just remember one thing, that it was always competitive about everything, and, and, but who has more dialogue and all this. It was, it was really crazy on that set and Predator. But I was so impressed. I mean, as a matter of fact, I got Jesse all of his jobs. I got him the job on Predator, then on, on Running Man. We got the job, I mean, it was like, he was, and he was really good in that also, you know? And then later on in Batman and Robin, you know, he was with Ralphie having, both of them were security uh, guys, and they were supposed to keep me in that uh, kind of prison and, 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 and uh, locked up and all that stuff. So they, they, he was always a really great addition in any movie. You took care of a lot of your friends. But Franco was in Terminator. A lot of people don't know that. He was one of the Terminators in the Yeah, yeah, no, he was Terminator and he was in Conan. In Conan, that's Franco right. Franco was in Conan the Barbarian. He played the Pictish, the Pictish warrior. <laughs> you know, they're always in the pit with the paint, with the body paint and all that stuff. And, uh, but it was fun having him on the set there and train with him. I had the training partner sure. there. And all Sven Ole Thorsen, also in, uh, exactly, one of your yeah. uh, old pals. Those guys, yes, a lot of those uh, guys were in the movies, and it's, it's, it's fun to do. When you were um, coming up, you said Reg Park was a, was a big inspiration, you know, with the Hercules movies, and even with, with, with bodybuilding. Um, you actually ended up competing against him. It was a little bit later in his career, but the, you guys faced off each other at the universe. I yeah, it was, was in 1970, just the day before, the night before, I beat Sergio Oliver here in Columbus. Uh, I won against uh, Reg Park. How was that? And it was, it, it was, he shouldn't have competed because he was now uh, 45 years old. And uh, I think that he was not quite as sharp anymore than he used to be. And I don't know why he decided to do that. To me, I did not know that he's going to be in a competition. All of a sudden, he's uh, standing there next to me in the lineup at the Mr. Universe contest. So it was, you know, one of those things. So I, of course, did everything I could to win. And uh, I'm sure he did everything he could to win. But, you know, he placed second, he placed right after me. And uh, I felt kind of uncomfortable about that, that I have beaten now my idol. It was kind of really weird. Phil, was that the same for you? Uh, we talked about this in regards to Jay Cutler, as you guys kind of came up, you were kind of under Jay's wing. Uh, but much like Arnold facing his idol, Reg Park, uh, did it put you in an uncomfortable position? Absolutely. I mean, because Jay's my brother, right? So also being in the trenches with him day in and day out, you know, with Hani, and I just respect his hard work. I respect Jay a lot. And, yeah, like I said earlier, me winning the Olympia, you know, was fantastic. But to have it, um, have that, uh, that dialogue with Jay thereafter of him literally giving me the nod, like, it's yours, you are the king, um, it definitely reminded me of what the mission truly is. And that mission is to take my physique to a whole new level. Because the last thing you want to do when someone is of standard and you become that standard is to be below that, be below that standard. And I know that Jay worked his ass off, and I refuse to not honor him and honor the support and the love by uh, failing myself in that gym. But yeah, it's, it's always tough. But I will say, um, I remember Jay, you called me once, and 
you told me straight up, like, you have to be Mr. Olympia. We're friends, we're bros, like, it is what it is, but you have to, in order to become Mr. Olympia, you can't think about that friendship. And that was difficult because, you know, I'm kind of a softie, you know, with, my, with the people who I love, I love them to death, right? Um, but I had to have a side of me that was about the Sandow title and what that meant. And that's why looking at those tapes of Jay, of Coleman, of Haney, and of course Arnold, it meant everything. So I was able to become uh, less uncomfortable as times went, but I, but I enjoyed the ride because we were able to not just uh, compete against each other a few times on the Olympia stage, but we went to India a, a week later. And, you know, Hani knows, like, it was hell for Jay for that one. And I remember just thinking of Arnold and Jay, you probably agree, in Pump and Iron, we had all seen it a zillion times of, like, you and Franco basically just chilling in the same room, lying down, just hanging out. In, in uh, Mumbai, India, Jay wasn't feeling well. And we were just hanging out in the room the same way you were. And I was just very thankful for those moments because although I had just won the Olympia, we were now in India together trying to get beef, which was a very difficult task because it's a sacred animal, you know, like it's a cow's <laughs> sacred animal. So we're definitely getting something other than beef, right? Um, but Jay was, I remember you were throwing up and I was like just hanging out with Jay just like, Jay's telling me, yeah, bro, like, you, you won this, bro. And I'm like, I don't really care. I just want to hang out with my friend. And I'll always remember those moments. So, yeah, you know, it was always difficult. Um, but it was very uh, revealing that we have a bond that will never be broken. Very nice, Phil. Very nice. Phil, you told me, even though you didn't get eight, as obviously you had seven uh, titles, seven Sandows, even though you didn't get eight, you've kind of embraced the idea that being with Arnold with seven is almost better. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I ain't going to lie. Right? I mean, I went for eight twice. And I remember people, um, you know who it was that told me to stop? It was Robert Earl. He said, why go for number eight? You're already tied with Arnold. And I said, but even Arnold would say, like, why not? Keep going. So I tried that, and then I didn't win. And I tried it again, didn't win. And I realized, if it's any consolation to be tied with the greatest, with Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'm doing pretty damn good. And I, I remember uh, it, was, uh, it was 2017, and I was getting ready for the, you know, I was in my off season, and I was at a booth, and, and uh, Arnold happened to go by certain booths, you know, to say hello. and shake some hands and Dexter Jackson and I were working at a, a supplement company booth and Arnold was being Arnold and we were doing a video together and he was razzing us both and I remember as you were walking away I, I it was something in my soul just told me you, you you respect Arnold so much but you gotta like grab him and 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 tell him something and I remember grabbing you and I said we're all here because of you all of the signage the merch everybody's here because of you and the hard work and dedication and sacrifices that you along with everybody that in your camp that put this thing together and I remember telling you it would I would be honored to be tied with you and no words were said but I got the stare that I'm getting right now and, and I and I got not necessarily a hug but it was like a grab on the shoulder and it was like the way I took that was okay Phil you done said it he heard you, you better go freaking do it, because if you don't, you're missing out. But I, I thought about that moment every freaking day, Arnold, and I and never been a, I had a chance to share that with you, but it meant the world to me. So when I get to go to California and I happen to see you at Gold's Venice at 7.30, 8 a.m., I'm like right there, I'm like, there he is. <laughs> I smile from end to ear, and just to be able to be in your presence um, is a dream come true, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's very obvious that I have to then say, Ronnie, why didn't you feel the same way? Why did you have to go for the eighth? Why couldn't you just tie? What went through your minds? 
why don't you explain it a little bit here to the people and then <laughs> and, and, and come clean? <laughs> well, come on, they, Ronnie. Uh, well, they say you were the greatest of all time, and you won seven. It, seven was the greatest. What would eight be? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's why I had to get eight wins so I could say I was. I beat you at something. <laughs> beat you at something. You sure did. <laughs> not, not an easy feat. <laughs> <It's Yeah>. a... <laughs> Arnold, you have to take great pride um, today that uh, an Olympia winner in Hadi Chupan, and Olympia winners uh, throughout history have always chose to compete at the Arnold still. Uh, there was a time uh, for a long time, really, I think until Ronnie uh, threw his hat in there, that if you were the Olympia winner, you know, you didn't really want to go to the Arnold. It's like, well, I'm already here. Uh, so you have to take great pride in the fact that you have uh, a champ just one year removed from that title that decided to come here and compete on this stage. Well, I think that both of those competitions are on an equal level. And uh, I think that it is always good for people that win the Olympia, to win also the Arnold's Classic. It's like in my days, it was good to win Mr. Universe and the Mr. Olympia competition. So we went back and forth even after I won Mr. Olympia, went back to the Mr. Universe. So I think that it's uh, natural to do that. But I also understand how some people feel reluctant because they feel like if I win the Olympia and I barely won the Olympia, maybe I shouldn't risk to go and maybe 14 days later or half year later or a few months later lose you know, and, uh, you know, not win the title, the Arnold Classic. So I understand that, but I mean, I think that it is very courageous of people to come to the Arnold Classic and to compete because it basically says, I am confident, I am the best in the world, and no matter what the title is called, I'm going to win. And, you know, I think that Hardy has nothing to worry about because he has just such an extraordinary physique right now and he's so tuned in that has such a great combination of uh, definition and of mass and of muscle separation and of his skill in posing and how long he can hold his pose I saw yesterday again he just held it he held that vacuum I mean, literally for like 30 seconds, he held the vacuum, and then he went into the app position and all that. So I think it would be very hard to, for anyone to beat him. So he can go to the Arnold Classic here. He can go to England in two weeks to the Arnold Classic. He can go from Arnold Classic to Arnold Classic to Olympia to Olympia, and he can win. So it's simple. This is his time right now. You know, and there will be a time then all of a sudden where he will have difficulty with that, and someone else will come up and win. So this is what happens with all of this. You know, there's always someone coming up in every sport, not just in bodybuilding, but in every sport, there's always someone coming up behind you that is going to take over, and it's going to beat your record, and it's going to be better than you and all this stuff. And so, so of course, all of the guys that are up here on the stage, they all are better than I was, and so this, it, which is fantastic. This is the way, this is what happens in, in sports. We, we just want the sport to grow and to grow and to grow and this is what I'm all about is, is not worrying about my, just my legacy, but my legacy will be that I've promoted the sport and I've created this competition and this festival. So that's it, rather than just the body. Well, Arnold, in your other career uh, in Hollywood, um, there's almost been something lost in the last 10 years, I feel, even though the, the superhero movies are absolutely fantastic. Um, it's largely CGI and the suits, obviously, kind of had the muscles in there and stuff. You came up with an era that you were the superhero. You and Stallone and, and, and some of the other greats, uh, which was fantastic to see you guys in The Expendables kind of get the team back together. Great movies. Um, but do you feel like something's a little bit lost in that and that we have now in the next generation, the guys coming after you guys, uh, you know, are they in the same boat as you? I mean, it's a little tougher in your case because you didn't have the suit with the muscles sewn in there. It was you. Well, I don't think that anyone has muscles sewn in there today. I think the guys that are really, what is really great today is 
that when I did Conan the Barbarian, I was the only guy in the acting business that had muscles. So I had to do my own stunts even when we were in Spain filming. I was doing all the sword fighting and falling off the horse and doing all of that stuff. The great, and luckily I was then in the 30s and my body was more durable and uh, I could take the punishment. But today, the day, I mean, it's like, it's, it's amazing of how many stunt guys today have a muscular body. It's amazing how many actors today, I mean, just look at this movie Reacher. I mean, this guy came out of nowhere and is this, this enormous and fantastic body and also the acting ability to pull it off. So there's many of this, that The Rock, for instance, The Rock came out of nowhere. I mean, he worked his way up in wrestling and uh, I remember then uh, he was uh, in a movie like 20 years ago and he was, oh, you could really tell that he had a certain personality and a certain talent and then all of a sudden he became a leading man in the movies and he could pull it off. His acting was really great, he was very funny, he had a huge physique. I mean, enormous and everything like this. So I think there's a lot of guys like that today out there that are doing a great job with those action movies. And I'm very pleased that there's so many of them that are now working out and that are really taking this whole thing seriously and inspiring so many people at the same time again to go and look like that. And so I think it's all good. Yeah, well, we got we got some great movies, that's oh, for yeah. sure. Marvel's done a fantastic job with bringing these comics to life and oh, yeah. uh, a lot of these stories that we all grew up on reading the comics. Yeah. Um, Jay, you uh, had a very special moment last night as we talked a little bit about earlier. Um, what did it mean to get a Lifetime Achievement Award from Arnold himself? I mean, like I shared with you, it's, you know, I made the decision to really pursue bodybuilding after watching Terminator uh, 2. It was 1991 and I joined the gym one month later uh, on that date and that was when I made my full commitment. You know, it was a dream, and, and, you know, he influenced me a lot alongside with Stallone and even Van Damme physiques because I never thought, you know, looking at Arnold physique, I could never be of that caliber. And, you know, where he's taken bodybuilding, you know, we all strive to even get a portion of what he's done to give back. And, and uh, you know, I just, I'm truly honored, especially watching the highlight reel and, you know, watching part of my journey being on this stage, I think actually I was in the Veterans uh, Memorial for a couple of those, but uh, you know, Jim Lormer, I remember Jim Lormer called me. I was at a gas station on the way home from the San Diego Zoo with my mom, and I just got second at the Olympia to Ronnie, the very controversial one where I probably should have won. And, <laughs> and it was Jim Lormer and he said, we want you in the Arnold Classic. And my mom said, who was that? I said, that is Arnold's partner at the time. And I said, she said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to home and start training for the Arnold Classic. And he said, I'm giving away an H2 Hummer and a Rolex and $100,000. And I'm like, I'm in. So I showed up and won my first in 2002. And uh, to be part of this, this whole uh, journey of, of what you know, we all strive to be, uh, and, and have that legacy, it's, it's just truly amazing. I'm blessed. Arnold, thank you so much for considering me for that award. And, uh, you know, I know Ronnie had won this before, Lee Haney. Uh, you know, Stallone won this, Tom Arnold won this, Reg Park, Joe Weider, Jim Mannion. I mean, so many names that we know that, we hold, that hold so much weight. You know, I'm just truly blessed and, you know, you're you're very motivating to all of us, and you continue to be, and, and uh, we all just want to be a part of what you've created. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> you know, Jay and I, I'm sure that everyone else here has the same in common, but I mean, one thing we have in common right off the top is our appreciation for Joe Wieda. And we talked about it yesterday. We were sitting there and just saying, you know, without Joe Weider, this wouldn't happen. And I think it's always very important that we recognize that because it was Joe Weider's magazines that really inspired me and that made me read through those magazines 
and made me train hard and follow those, the Joe Weider principles, which were basically our principles, but then he just called them Joe Weider principles, right? But we didn't care because the, who, whose name is on it because we were inspired by that. And then um, when I moved to America, he treated me like a son. You know, he got me an apartment and I rented a car and I could train here and build myself up. And you know, of course, yeah, I did the endorsements for his uh, products and I did the photo shoots for his magazine and all that stuff. But he always treated me just like a son and he inspired me to go to college and to get my degree in business. And he inspired me to get into the movie business and to follow my dream and all of that. And so there was many, many hours that I've spent with him together that were very, very inspirational. He got me into appreciating art. He would take me to art galleries. He would take me to art auctions and explain to me how an auction really works. And that's what got me into then into art and collecting art and all this. He taught me about business. He took me to business uh, meetings, international business meetings to Japan and to Holland and to Finland and stuff like that. I did then exhibitions all over the world for him. So, but anyway, Joe Weider was a very important force in our life, and so we always have to recognize, and I want to make sure that all of you and the people out there know that Joe Weider was really the one that gave us this world of bodybuilding and did it so well through his magazines and through his products and food supplements and weight equipment and all of those kind of things. So Jay and I, we have shared this, our experiences. And of course, when we talk about Joe Weider, we always have to laugh a lot because there's also a lot of funny moments, right? With, uh, with, with Joe, I mean, he's, he's, he's a real character. But in any case, uh, I just want you to be aware of it. Joe Weider was the real, real action that got us all inspired and got into the, in the bodybuilding. Enough can't be said. Uh, enough can't be said about Joe Weider. Obviously, like you said, we would never, none of us would be here. But um, one of the things I miss about having Franco here was you guys had some of the best stories about Joe Weider. Uh, one of my favorites always, and uh, maybe you can. Uh, put this back out there for for this crowd here today. Um, did you guys actually get Joe drunk to, to negotiate a new contract? Well, yes, that's that's uh, that's off the record. Uh, of course, uh, every no, but I mean, but stays one, here. One of my favorite story was when Franco first moved over to America. He convinced Joe that he knows how to trim hair and mustaches. And Joe had a mustache. And so Joe said to him, he says, well, I need to have my hair trimmed a little bit here. And of course, Franco didn't know what the hell he was doing. <laughs> and so he, he cut down on the, the, the Adi Zeller, the photographer, right? We were in his apartment, and he gave uh, Franco a, a scissor. And uh, Franco took the scissor and started cutting on his hair. But before he totally kind of like cut the hair, he pulled the scissor away. And so he always ripped the hair rather than cutting the hair. And Joe would always scream, he says, oh, come on, Franco, what's the matter with you? Oh, little bastard, eh? You know, and he would just scream and he would get really more and more mad. And Franco says, ah, Joe, I, I have to cut a little bit more over here. And then Joe says, okay, but do it, right, but don't rip my hair out. What's the matter with you? Oh, those Italian bastards, eh? You know, and he would always just you know, call Franco a little bastard. <laughs> so, and Franco, of course, would just cut down again and then rip away with the scissor. I, I, don't, think, I don't think that Franco, you know, knew what he was doing. It was not like he was trying to pull the hair on purpose. He just never really cut fully down to cut the hair and then remove the scissor. So Joe went absolutely insane, and eventually the, the whole thing... Uh, Joe made Franco discontinue the cutting or the ripping of the hair and all that stuff. So there was always those scenes like that that were very, very funny. It was with Franco and with Joe. But uh, Joe had, you know, great, great scenes in there. It's like, uh, you know, he would just, he would go in a photo shoot with the, with the five bodybuilders and there would be the photographer and the help of the photographer 
and delighting people and all that stuff on the beach. And then they will, we will go to a restaurant afterwards for lunch. And he says, oh, God damn it, I forgot my wallet. <laughs> and then he goes to Adi Zella and he says, hey, Adi, can you loan me $20? So Adi says, Joe, I said, we are like 12 people. How can you eat for $20 with, with, with 12 people? There's no such thing. He says, oh, Christ sakes, Adi. Come on now, don't be so negative, eh? You know, so there was always things like that. I mean, we were laughing with him. Endless amount of stories with Joe Wheeler. He forgot his wallet, left his money in the bank, huh? Oh, yes. <laughs> so, Arnold, where do you go from here? I mean, you have literally done it all, from bodybuilding champion to movie star, number one in the world, many, many years, dabbled in politics, earning, earning the title of governor, um, Netflix specials, I mean, uh, things covering your, your entire life, um, various business uh, ventures and things like that. Where do you aspire, what keeps you going now? Um, I think my main motivation today is to help other people. And, you know, this is all has to do is that 20 years ago, I would have never told you that's where my life would be going. 10 years ago, probably, I wouldn't have told you that. But uh, for some reason or the other, this whole idea of doing speeches around the world where you tell people kind of the secrets to success and giving them the tools to success, that's what led then eventually to writing the book be useful but this is what I do is so many times people ask me to do a speech somewhere and they pay a lot of money for this stuff and I said to them I said what do you want me to talk about the environment you want me to talk about my governorship and they always say no 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 just talk about how to be successful just pump up our audience and teach them how to be successful so you know so I realized that people really need positive reinforcement and I think that's one of the reasons why I started my newsletter and why I started the Pump Club, is to help, yeah, to help people, basically, you know, because so many people feel helpless. So many people sometimes feel depressed about something. And they need someone to guide them. And, you know, when you go on the Internet, there's so much negativity. So we wanted to become kind of the positive corner of the internet, where people can become part of a village, of a community, and not only get inspiration from us, but to get inspiration from each other, so that this community all works together. So if someone says, I want to lose weight, I'm depressed, that I'm 150 pounds overweight, that everyone kind of writes him back and says, you can do it. You can do it, start out with the first uh, 10 pounds and then a second 10 pounds, and this is how you kind of, and then all of a sudden, you know, half a year later, this person is saying, okay, I lost 120 pounds, and everyone is congratulating that person. So I, I think this is so good when you can help people become more successful, and become happier, and everyone needs a little push, and everyone needs a direction, and you know, kind of having a goal, and how do you set goals, and how do you make certain sacrifices, and, uh, you know, what do you do every day in order to become more successful and happier and all this? So this is the kind of things that we deal with now. And the newsletter and the pump club and all of this stuff has become hugely successful. It's going through the roof right now because we are offering something that most people need. Yeah. I know you've got a, a whole bunch of current projects and things like that, but uh, are we gonna, is movies still the thing for you? Is that still something you aspire to? Maybe move into different, I know you've done some directing, obviously, over the years, uh, different things like that. Well, yeah, we'll be starting end of April now in Toronto, the second, the next season for FUBA. So we're going to, we're going to film from end of uh, April to middle of September. So we'll be there for four and a half months, and um, it's going to be a lot of fun, but of course a lot, a lot of hard work. Uh, TV series is much faster than a movie. You know, in a movie you kind of do two hours of movie on the screen, and you shoot this for three, four months, sometimes five months. But then the TV series, you know, each hour is kind of like ten days shooting, so you're much faster with the whole thing. 
and uh, so we all have to button up and do that but I mean it's going to be fun to do so yes I will continue on doing movies then afterwards in the fall when I'm finished with that I will start another film um, and so yeah I'm I am very fortunate that I have many different lives so I have the life of being a motivator, I have the life of being the terminator, I have the life of uh, being you know, the actor, to be the environmentalist and go and give speeches about the environment. Or for instance, this afternoon, we are having a big uh, kind of event here in Columbus about redistricting reform. Now most people are gonna say, what the hell is that? Uh, but uh, you know, it's uh, very, very important because by the way they do the gerrymandering in America, is how they fix elections. And so I have noticed that when I became governor in California, then we kind of changed it in California and we uh, created an independent redistricting commission. And now other states are trying to copy us in California. And one of them is Ohio. In Ohio, they tried to do a commission, but it didn't really work out well. So now they're really going all out with, a, with an uh, initiative that it will be on a ballot and they're going to go all out and try to do an independent commission like we do in California. So this is the kind of thing. So, you know, I have the Schwarzenegger Institute, which is a, a kind of a think tank and the institute that deals, you know, with better policies, uh, you know, national and international policies, environmental issues, healthcare issues, homeless issues, and uh, infrastructure issues and so on. So th I'm involved in that. So there's many different hats that I wear, and this is what makes my life so interesting that, you know, from moment to moment it changes all the time and uh, it makes my life interesting and spicy and uh, I love it. Well, we love it too. Um, I'm hearing some smatterings that they're actually thinking about redoing some of your movies. We've now been around long enough that this is actually a thing. Uh, I've heard it, The Running Man they were considering redoing, uh, the original Predator, things like that. What do you feel about that, like when you hear about the them redoing like one of your does it something that you go great it's the next generation go for it or you think like man some things you just should leave alone like i don't think they should ever redo any of your iconic movies like like terminator i've even heard which i can't even imagine them redoing well i mean i think that uh, to redo something um if it's done well doesn't make any sense uh to do a sequel that, that doesn't make sense if you have an interesting story you know that sometimes there's an interesting story like for instance in Predator they have tried to redo Predator and they failed then they tried to do sequels to Predator and they failed and then just finally like a half a year ago I saw one that uh, came out like a year ago or so and that was actually very good a Predator movie and so uh, so it really depends I think with Running Man I think that uh, there could be a remake because now you can bring the technology up to date and make do something really interesting uh, so I wish them good luck with that in most cases when they've tried to remake a movie or, or a project it has failed you know so I, 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 I think that if you don't have a really good story or better story than the original was you shouldn't go there and waste you know 30 40 50 million dollars and then tank at the box office is if they came to you and they offered you a role in there, a different role in one of those, is that something you would consider or you just... No, you know, I, not I'm, really. I'm, I'm not that interested in going from movie to movie like I used to be. I used to was interested in doing two movies a year, one action movie and one comedy. But now it's kind of like if I do one movie a year, I'm fine. Um, I'm not looking for the next job. I'm not <laughs> looking kind of like... A lot of actors do. I have to work in order to feel like I'm productive right. because I do so many other things. So I'm not really that eager. So if a good project comes along, I do it. If an interesting director is asking me, then I consider it. Uh, but other than that, I'm not looking for another job. Was uh, is Twin still a thing? I know that was kind of being talked about for a little while. No, no, that that, that was called Triplets. Triplets. Yeah, right, triplets. That's a sequel. Um, it was a very serious project until Ivan Reitman, the director, passed away. That's right. And he has a son that, for some reason or the other, he's a director himself, the son, a very, very good director. 
but for some reason or the other, he felt kind of like he dis does not want to continue on with that project. And we don't know why, but I mean, that, that's just the way he feels, and therefore he can't, and therefore we will, Danny and I will do another movie together, but not triplets. Gotcha. But we can kind of do triplets now with the, with the State Farm commercial, <laughs> right? That's right, absolutely. Well, Arnold, uh, we know you got a lot of uh, things you still have to attend to here on Sunday. We thank you for coming out once again. That was a great, to me, this is always the golden jewel, as Jim Dormer used to call it, of the evening. How about a big hand, folks? The one and only Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank everyone up here on the stage. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you all for being here today. We appreciate it. Arnold, I assume that we will see you back next year? Absolutely. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> all right, my pleasure.